Okay. Okay, everybody, we're just going to plow right in. Um, my name is uh, James Campbell, or most people call me Jimmy. My name is Jimmy Campbell. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk, well, first of all, I've got to thank Colin for the invitation and for organizing this event. I'm very happy to be here and very happy that you're all here. Otherwise, I just obviously be talking to the walls. So thank you for coming out. I know these days with Netflix and everything else, it's hard to get people out of the house, particularly for events like these. So, so thank you very much for coming out. Um, today, I'm going to talk about um, two of my Alaska books and also a little bit about um, the show that I act as an executive producer for called The Last Alaskans, um, which is on Discovery Channel. And maybe some of you have, have seen that show. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin... With this book, it's called Braving It. It has a very long subtitle, A Father, a Daughter, and an Unforgettable Journey into the Alaskan Wild. Before I trudge off and talk about this, how many of you have read it? Just a show of hands? Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Well, that means I can talk a lot about this book, um, since most of you haven't read it. Anyway, um, this book is, is, of course, a father-daughter book in an exploration of the father-daughter relationship. <laughs> Oddly enough, when I was thinking about writing this book, I looked around and there are no father-daughter books. Um, I'm a writer and the father of three daughters, so I didn't have the opportunity to write a father-son book, so I wrote a father-daughter book. Um, this, this book, a lot of people ask, or a lot of people who haven't read the book, look at the cover and say, oh, it's an adventure story, right? And it, it kind of is. On the surface, it's an adventure story. It's about, maybe you heard me talking earlier, it's about three trips that my then 15-year-old daughter and I made into the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge of Alaska. And um, it is, uh, I guess, it is an adventure story, but there are a whole bunch of other themes that I hope I've achieved. And I guess after you read it, um, you know, you can be the judge. Uh, it is an exploration, as I said, of the father-daughter bond and how that bond was challenged and I hope enhanced by our experience in the wilderness. Um, it's about joy. Uh, you don't, you can't, if you're a wilderness lover and you're in 20 million acres of raw wilderness, you feel joy. You occasionally feel fear, but most of the time you feel joy. Um, it's about breaking out of your comfort zone. Uh, whether you're a middle-aged man like me or a 15-year-old girl, um, as far as I'm concerned, that's what makes life worth living. Um, it's about uh, nature and our need for nature. Uh, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with Aldo Leopold. Aldo Leopold called nature meat from God. And another writer, Edward Abbey, whom you may be familiar with, called it a necessity of the human spirit. And one of the last themes is um, the, in something I think every parent in this audience can relate to. It's about the joy and pain of letting go. Um, and uh, so, anyway. Um, the... The other thing, the other thing about this book is people often ask when they hear that I've taken my daughter to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is 20 million acres of wilderness. It sits way up in northeastern Alaska. Um, the, the refuge itself extends from the Arctic Ocean 200 miles south, almost to the Yukon River, and from west to east from the Trans Alaska Pipeline to the Canadian border, and it is raw wilderness. And if you add the two parks on the Canadian side, Ivavik and Vuntuk, to that wilderness um, adjoining it, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, um, it is 40 million acres of wilderness, which is the largest protect, one of the largest protected ecosystems on the planet. So the question a lot of people ask is why? Or what in the world possessed you to take your 15-year-old daughter there? And I think it's a very legitimate question, um, given some of the dangers of travel in an area like that. And it's something 
that I will try to address um, as I talk about the book. Um, the other question they ask is, what inspired the book? And um, in order to do that, I have to show you, and this is not a shameless <laughs> promotional pitch for my first quote, but um, it's, it, it, it's derived from this first book. How many of you have read this, The, the Final Frontiersman? Okay, again, so this book was made into the Discovery Channel series called The Last Alaskans. Um, and this book is about my first cousin, a guy named Jaime Kaur, who grew up in Appleton, Wisconsin. And at the age of 20 in 1975, Jaime left Appleton, Wisconsin because the pavement hurt his feet. He left Appleton, Wisconsin for Alaska, he was part of um, what another writer called, named John McPhee called the coming into the country generation, which was a unique generational moment, a movement of men, men and some women like Haimo, daring, idealistic men who wanted to challenge themselves and try to live by their wits in the Alaskan wilderness. Most of the men and women who went up um, and ended up in the interior of Alaska, ended up on the Yukon River. Haimo, the, the subject of this book, went 130 miles north of the Arctic Circle um, and 100 miles from the nearest neighbor. He lived in um, the southern foothills of the Eastern Brooks Range, and he lived alone, absolutely alone, again, 100 miles from the nearest neighbor for six years. Um, eventually, he says he almost went mad. He says, no man is a wolverine. Man, A wolverine is a strict loner, but, a, but man needs people. After six years, he married a woman named Miti Dawin, or Edna, and who was a Siberian Yupik Eskimo from an island near, near between, just between mainland Alaska and um, Russia. In fact, it was closer to Russia than Alaska. And she agreed to join Haimo in the interior of Alaska, and they raised three daughters there. And the book is about the joys and the hardships and the one great tragedy that continues to affect their lives. But um, writing this book, for me, was a labor of love. Um, I remember I was 12 when Haimo left for Alaska. And I remember being full of admiration and pride and vowing that when I turned 18, I was going to do exactly the same thing. I was going to go to Alaska and I was going to be a mountain man. Well, when I turned 18, I went to the East Coast. And no self-respecting mountain man in the making ever goes to Connecticut. <laughs> so that is not training for being a mountain man. So I never got to be a mountain man. But by writing this book, and I lived with Haimo and Edna and their daughters for two years, I trapped with them, I hunted with them, I built cabins with them, I did everything they did. So by writing this book, I got to live a portion of my own dream. Anyway, when I was writing the book, I was researching and writing the book, I'd come home and I was just brimming with enthusiasm. All I wanted to do was tell Alaska stories. And at first, everybody was captivated. They couldn't wait to hear about bear stories and moose stories and lonely tundra stories. And then I started noticing that when I'd walk down the sidewalk in, in our little town, the people would go over to the other side of the other side of the road. And I couldn't figure out why. And my wife said, took me aside and she said, you're talking too much about Alaska. Even my wife made a rule in the house, no more Alaska stories. Well, um, my daughter, who was five then, Aiden, who you, whom you see in this picture, she was just a little sprout with a big imagination and big dreams. And she said, Daddy, she said, I want to hear your Alaska stories. You can tell them time and time again to me. I will never, ever tire of your Alaskan story. But... And I, she said, but you got to make a promise to me. So she was smart enough to exact a promise. She said, you got to promise that when I come of age, if I'm willing to listen to your stories over and over again, that when I come of age, you will take me to Alaska 
on a big adventure. And I kind of not thinking about it really said, of course, Aiden, I promise you, I'll take you to Alaska. So in the ensuing years, she reminded me of my promise. And then when she turned 14 years old, she really held my feet to the fire. She said, okay, no longer daddy, unfortunately. Okay, dad. She said, don't forget your promise. You promised you were going to take me to Alaska. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, why not? I thought she has wilderness skills. She spent a lot of time in the Wisconsin woods and the UP and Idaho and Montana and Colorado. Um, she also wants to spend time with me. My 14-year-old daughter wanted to spend half the summer with me. I should, I, I think a lot of fathers would have been envious of that. Um, and also, I think that wilderness is a great classroom. There's no, I don't know if we have any teachers here. Um, my wife's also a teacher. But there, as far as I'm concerned, there's no better classroom in the world than wilderness. You learn all of those life skills that you can use in the classroom, but all of those life skills that you can use until you're pushing up daisies, you self-sufficiency, you learn independence, you learn um, how to overcome adversity, you learn um, how to be confident in tough situations. So I was delighted to, to that she wanted to go off on a wilderness adventure with me. So we started plotting, and again, these are just cycling through. Um, and in no, my my talk has no relationship to the photo, so enjoy them as much as you want. Um, so, so we did a lot of training for this trip. We put on backpacks. We trudged all over. We did compass work. We did GPS work. We talked about safety in bear country, and we really started imagining this trip and going over maps and getting incredibly excited about it. And then about a month and a half before we, we were going to leave, uh, I got a call. Paimo had just come out of the bush. They live in the bush for nine to ten months a year in the bush by what I mean by that is they live in the wilderness in their cabin. And then for two months of the year, they come out. They come to Fairbanks or Fort Yukon to sell their furs and for a brief dose of civilization. So um, Paimo called me on the phone and he said, Jimmer, Jimmer. And I can, there was a lot of urgency in his voice. Has anybody seen Escanaba in the Moonlight, the Jeff Daniels film? Well, then you know Jimmer. Paimo called, it's Paimo's favorite movie. And he calls me Jimmer or Da Jimmer. He said, Da Jimmer. He said, I need your help. I said, what, Paimo? He said, the river is rerouted itself this spring and it's going to sweep away my cabin. You've got to come up this summer and you got to help me build a cabin. I said, Paimo, any other summer I do it, but I got, you know, this grand adventure with my daughter planned, and I don't know. And he said, I need it. I need you. I really need your help. And I said, well, I'll think about it. And he said, well, don't think about it too long. If you can't do it, i got to find someone else who will. So I hung up the phone and thought, wow, now I'm really in a predicament. What do I do? So I walked upstairs and my daughter Aiden was studying in her room and I said, hey, Aiden, I got a proposition for you. I said, that was Haimo on the phone and he wants me or us to come up this summer and help him build a cabin. I said, how would you feel about that? And um, she kind of frowned and I said, you know, I don't want to oversell it or undersell it, but it's going to be hard work, really hard work, but it could be... It, it could be the experience of a lifetime. And I want you at least to think about it. So she promised me she would. The next morning, she walked downstairs in the kitchen. I'm the breakfast guy at home. And I was making breakfast for my three daughters. And she walked in very confidently and she said, Dad, I'm in. And I said, are you sure? Because when I call HIMO, there's no backing out. And she said, yes, I want to do it. I said, okay. So she went off to school and I called Haimo and Haimo picked up the phone and I said, all right. And he said, oh, thank you, Jimmer. Thank you so much. I need you so desperately. I'm glad you decided to come up. And then I said, we're in. And then there was about 10 minutes of silence and he said, who's the we? And I said, the we, Haimo, is me and my 15-year-old daughter, Aiden. And then there was another 10 seconds of silence. And he said, that ain't 
a very good idea. So, so I said, well, Haimo, I said, we're a package deal. If you want me, you got to take both of us. And Haimo said, will she work? And I said, yeah, she's a hard worker. And he said, again, long, long pause. He said, well, bring her up, but she ain't going to be happy. Well, I, that was prophetic. Um, for the first 10 days, Aiden was not only not happy, she was distinctly unhappy. Um, it, there, a couple things contributed to that. First of all, the work. We were working our tails off. So we were, we were cutting trees, we were limbing them, we were bucking them, we were dragging them out of the woods. Aiden's primary job, has anybody used a draw knife here before? Um, Aiden's primary job was to use the draw knife and peel all these poles. Now, if you peel poles um, on live trees, when the sap is running, it just comes off like butter. But when you take dead old spruce trees that have been lying there for a long time, it doesn't come off. It comes off like rhinoceros skin, and it's really, really hard work. Well, ultimately, Aiden peeled 90 poles for the cabin. And um, she peeled them during Alaska's worst mosquito season. So we arrived, we arrived in Alaska and we looked at the Fairbanks News Miner and the first thing we saw was worst bug season in, in the Alaskan interior in 40 years. <laughs> so we cringed. So people always say, bugs up in the Arctic? How does that happen? Well, it happens because... There's permafrost. So when the snow melts, the ground can't absorb it. So it has nowhere to go. So there are these ponds and puddles all over. And the mosquitoes use the opportunity to hatch by the trillions. So we built smudge fires all around the cabin with young willow while we were, while we were building this cabin. And so we almost died of, of asphyxiation, but we, at least we were able to keep away the bugs. Um, Aiden also had, as she calls it, bear on the brain. So before we left for Alaska, as I said, we did all this grizzly training. Um, what to do, what to do if you encounter a grizzly, how to talk, how to move, how to use your pepper spray. Some people think you just spray it. Well, you don't. There, there's a very specific way you use bear spray. And so we talked about all that, and Aiden was very, very confident and, you know, didn't seem frightened or apprehensive at all. Well, we got to Fairbanks um, before we went out into the bush, and we were camping um, just outside of Fairbanks. Um, and Aiden met this woman whose summer job was to uh, tend to the campground, and they started this, had a brief, you know, friendship while we were there. And the woman told her that about a friend of hers, that had recently been mauled by a grizzly bear in the gates of the Arctic National Park, which was right next, just west of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. So suddenly Aiden was terrified of bears. Um, so terrified of bears, she wouldn't, she would, she wouldn't walk anywhere she went. I had to accompany her. And I said, Aiden, you know, you've got to get over this because um, you, you're just not going to have any freedom of movement. Well, what contributed to her fear was about four days in, a bush pilot flew in and he was bringing in drums of gasoline for Heimo's snow machine during the, during the winter. And Heimo and I were lugging him off the plane and putting him in the willow bar. And I saw Aiden talking to the, um, to the, talk, talking to the bush pilot. And um, he eventually took off and I came over and I walked over to Aiden. And I could see that she was really agitated and I couldn't figure out why. I said, Aiden, what's wrong? And he said, I, she said, I don't like that bush pilot. He's, he's a friend of mine. I said, Rick's a great guy. You know, what, what happened? And um, she said, you know what? He looked at my bear bells and he said, are those bear bells? And I said, yes. And he said, well, good. They're going to help with the identification. And Aiden wow. said, 
I didn't know what he was talking about. So I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, when we see a big steaming pile of bear crap with bear bells in it, we'll know it's you. So, so he had pulled the oldest Alaska joke on her and she was terrified. So from that moment on, she was really, really frightened of grizzly bears. Um, she was also lonely, as you can imagine. She's a 15 year old girl in the middle of nowhere, the only, she was allowed to make one phone call home in five weeks to her mom on the satellite phone, which was going to last for exactly one minute. And she was stranded up there with me and Haimo. Haimo's her uncle, but she'd never met Haimo before. And Haimo and I did these stupid cheese head skits all day. Has anybody ever seen Guys on Ice, the play Guys on Ice? Okay. <laughs> So we would do these guys on ice routines all day long, which is which is a caricature of Wisconsin ice fishing culture. And Hyman would say, oh, Jimmer, how are you feeling this morning? And he said, the walleye are biting down on the river, so don't get all shined up tonight because we got to go fishing. So he would do his, his, his Canadian, you know, Wisconsin accent, and we would do these skits all day long. And Aiden loved them for the first two days. By the, by the third day, she detested them, and she detested us. She didn't want to be anywhere around us. She, all she wanted to do was get away, but she couldn't because she was terrified of bears. So there, about two weeks in, she had this turnaround. She had this revelation. And it was actually precipitated by, by a fight we had had or an argument we had had. Um, one night we were sitting in the tent and um, Aiden pulled out this little, little mirror, which she called the, her last vestige of civilization. And she had been working really hard. Her hair, hair was matted. It was in dreadlocks. She'd been slapping at mosquitoes. So she had blood on her face and she stumped. She had, she's, she smelled, as she said, like the monkey cage at the zoo because she was working and sweating for two weeks without a bath. And um, then she looked at the mirror and then she looked at me and she said, Dad, am I pretty? And, and I, I was kind of dumbfounded. I didn't know how to respond. And I responded very coarsely. I didn't realize that at that moment, what she needed more than anything else was compassion. And I said, oh, I'd give you a B or B plus. And she looked at me with, with outrage. And I could see tears starting to well in her eyes. And I thought, oh, you are such an oaf. You are such an idiot. So the lesson there is if you're ever, anybody in this audience, if you're ever in the woods on a camping outing or a wilderness outing, with your daughter or granddaughter, and she asks you if you're pretty, if she's pretty, she's an A plus. Make sure you say she's an A plus. So anyway, she was really upset with me, and I tried to apologize, and she would not hear my apology, rightfully so, I suppose. So the next morning I woke up, and she was gone, and there was this note in the tent, and it said, she said, it said, Dad, I went down to the river to take a bath, and I brought the shotgun with me. <laughs> so suddenly I was panic stricken. The, the Colleen River is a glacial fed river. It is cold, 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 colder than Lake Superior, and the current is extremely fast. And it was starting to cool off, so the bears were coming out of the high country and they were starting to move along the river. I thought, oh my God, I got to get down there as fast as I can. So I started running down there and I almost got there and then I stopped. And I thought, no, this is exactly what I shouldn't be doing. I shouldn't come. She had enough confidence to go down there. I shouldn't be trying to rescue her. I shouldn't be some, you know, helicopter dad in the Arctic coming to save her for, for from something. And I thought, this is exactly what I wanted her to do. I wanted her to assert her independence. I wanted to, her to absorb the experience by getting out on her own a little. And so I, 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 you know, kind of hid my panic and walked down to the river. And she was sitting on 
um, a piece of driftwood, actually a driftwood log. And she was looking north into the Brooks Range. And it's one of the most spectacular views you've ever seen in your life. It's just barren, just treeless. And there are these beautiful glaciers all over the Brooks Range. And she was looking north into the Brooks Range. And I put my arm around and I said, you know, I'm really, really sorry about last night. And she said, I forgive you, Dad. And then she looked into she looked into the mountains and she said, now I know why you brought me here. And for the first time, for the first time on that trip, when she said that, I thought, oh, you know, this is what I've been waiting for. This moment of realization or revelation. I was deeply ambivalent. Um, actually not ambivalent, but I was deeply regretful for those first 10 days or two weeks of bringing her there. I thought, what have I done? I've not only, I've not only turned my daughter against wilderness, she's going to end up hating me for the rest of her life. But when she was looking in at the Brooks Range, she had a moment where apparently she realized that, um, why she was up there. So um, that was that was the end of um, our summer trip. We built virtually. This is the cabin, by the way. That anybody who's seen the show, that's on the show. And um, the only thing we didn't get done was the floor. We got everything else done, and it was hard work. So I'm going to just read read something to you from the first chapter, and it will take about a minute and a half. I I hope you don't mind. And, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the winter trip and then the final trip. And, okay. So this is called Into the Wild, Chapter 1. The July sky was blue and brittle, and the air over the craggy peaks of the White Mountains looked as if it could shatter. Below, mist wafted out of the thick woods along Beaver Creek. The water was high and cloudy with runoff. I look back at my daughter, Aiden, cramped in her jump seat, her head resting on her backpack in a dramamine-induced sleep. I was grateful that on this, her first flight in the bush plane, the weather was fairly calm. I saw the gold cross that was once my grandmother's hanging from her neck. My mother gave it to her just days before we left Alaska. To keep you safe, she said. So I'm just going to jump ahead. We waved goodbye as Daniel, our pilot, taxied to the north end of the gravel bar. We heard him rev the Helios engine. And when the plane rumbled past in a swirl of wind, spinning gravel and scattered sticks, we all waved again. As it disappeared down river, Hymo spun in a circle with his arms outstretched in Alaskan Zorba the Greek. Damn, he said, I feel so lucky to live out here. An hour later, after transporting our gear to the campsite and setting up our tent, we walked with our fishing rods north along the river through the willows and the head-high cottonwoods, purple Siberian asters and yellow Arctic daisies clinging to the sand, and tufts of white cotton grass. A flock of hooded mergansers croaked as they whipped by. Soon the caribou would be coming. I got to show you this grayling hole, Haimo told us excitedly. You'll love it. There'll be a breeze, too, so there ain't going to be many skeeters. We reached the gravel bar, and while I tried to tie on a small dry fly, without the aid of my reading glasses, Aiden threw out a spinner. Seconds later, her line was taut and bouncing. Look at that, Haimo said. First cast. Aiden was beaming. Our last few fishing outings, perhaps fathers can relate to this or mothers, um, had been family affairs in which I'd spent much of the time on tangling lines, grumbling, and getting irritable. By the time I was ready to cast, Aiden had already brought in two 15-inch Arctic railings. She held one up for me to see and grabbed its dorsal fin, which fanned out like that of a miniature sailfish. She laid it down and thumped it over the head with a rock, and the fish shuddered. Hyma was lying among the smooth and silvery stones, too blissed out, even to bother wetting his line. If Aiden could learn anything from him, it would be to live in the here and now, and what my Idaho writer friend John Rember called the thin moment of the present. Should I catch more, Aiden asked, hopefully, 
Keep fishing if you want, Hymo said, propping himself on his elbow, up on his elbows. We ain't in no hurry. It's six o'clock and the sun don't set till August. <laughs> so, yeah, 24 hours of light there from um, May until about mid-August. So after the summer trip, we came home. After the cabin building trip, we came home. And um, I thought Aiden would be happy to be home. She had all the things she missed. In the bush, she had running water. She could talk with her friends, um, and you know she was home and had had you know some some level of comfort. But she she was there was something wrong with her. She was um, she seemed disillusioned and disoriented and disappointed and all the disses you can think of. She was just unhappy. One day we were building a chicken coop and she was peeling more poles, and um, she. She wasn't helping much. And I said, I got irritated with her. I said, what's wrong? Come on, I need your help. And she said, I got to talk to you, Dad. And she said, I'm just unhappy. I feel like I have this hole in my heart. When I was in Alaska the first two weeks, all I wanted to do was come home. And then the last three weeks, I can't tell you how much I loved it. I, couldn't, I didn't even want to come home when Daniel showed up after those three weeks. She said, I got to ask you a question, and I don't want to sound spoiled. She said, but you think that there's a chance we might be able to go back sometime? And those, those, that, those words were music to my ears. <laughs> so I had thought about if she did well and she liked it, but, and Haimo invited us back. Haimo said, man, that Aiden works hard. She can come up anytime she wants. So, and Haimo said before we left, if you want to come up this winter, come on up this winter. We could use you caribou hunting or on the trap line or doing any number of things. So when Aiden said that, I said, I, it, was, it, it was beautiful. Those were the words I wanted to hear. Plus, I kind of thought I might write a book, but I didn't know. I didn't know about having enough material. I certainly couldn't have written a book based on that first cabin building um, Adventure. I probably could have written a magazine article or a newspaper article, and that's about it. So I said, "Yeah, yeah, let's go." I I want to. Let, of course, let's go. I want to take you to Alaska in winter. So we flew up, and we arrived in Fairbanks, and it was forty-two degrees below zero. We had all our winter gear. We put it on. We were there for three days, and um, we got accustomed to our gear and accustomed to the cold. We for three days we walked all around Fairbanks. And Aiden hated it. And I said, Aiden, this is what we gotta do. You know, you gotta get used to you gotta get used to the cold and the wind and everything else before we get out we get out to um oh uh oh that's the end of the phone. <laughs> Low battery. Sorry about that. That's the only thing I forgot about. Um so we got out, the bush pilot picked us up in Fairbanks and we flew out um, to the Colleen River. It was about a three hour flight from Fairbanks in little um, 185. And um, we landed on, on um, skis on the gravel bar. I know had smoothed it and taken away all the, all the logs and rocks and everything. And we landed and it was, I, there was, 38 degrees below zero out there at the time. And we had, before we'd gone out, Aiden and I had gone to the this, this store, the grocery store, Fred Meyer and Fairbanks, and we bought three shopping carts full of fresh fruits and fresh veg vegetables for Haimo and Edna, which they never get. They eat meat, meat, and more meat. 90% of their diet is meat. So um, I knew Haimo would be happy with the, with the fresh produce. So we started pulling it off and Haimo's eyes popped out. He came down to greet us. He said, oh man, he said, we got to get these up to the cabin as fast as we can before they freeze. Plus our pilot want, didn't want the plane to ice up. So he wanted to put down and get out as quickly as he could. So we loaded the, the, the snow sled with our, with our groceries and fresh produce. And um, then, Hi, then Haimo said to Aiden, Aiden, jump on behind, she said, and I'll take you up to the cabin. And then he threw a pair of snowshoes at me, and he said, Jimmer, you're walking. So <laughs> I put on the snowshoes, and I started walking toward the cabin. 
And I got there about 20 minutes later, and I saw I saw Aiden. Shoot, did you all see that um, orange tent, the double wall tent? Okay, so that's called the. It's a double wall tent. It's called the Arctic Oven. Aiden promptly renamed it the Arctic Ice Box. <laughs> so she was standing in front of the Arctic Oven, and Heim was was saying, "Aiden, this here tent is your home away from home." And I could see Aiden looking at the tent and looking for the cabin, looking at the tent and looking at the cabin. Before we got up, she said, Dad, do you think Heimo and Edna are going to let us stay in their cabin with them? And I said, I really doubt it. Their cabin is as big as a one-car garage. It is 16 by 16. That's the size of their cabin. And that's where they live. That's where they work on fur. That's where they dance. That's where they play cards and listen to music. And, and it's not because they're inhospitable people that they didn't want us in there. They just wanted their privacy. So um, so Aiden quickly realized that we weren't going to be in the cabin. We were going to be living in the tent. Then Haima pointed to the stovepipe, and she said, you, he said, you and your old man keep that cr- free of creosote, or you're going to go up in flames in the middle of the night. And then he turned to his wood pile. He had 12 cords of wood cut, you know, stack, split. <coughs> And he pointed to the wood pile and he said, by the way, that's me and Edna's wood pile. He said, you got to cut and split your own. And by the way, I shoot firewood thieves. So he was giving Aiden a hard time. And then she, he said to Aiden, oh, Aiden, by the way, i got to show you the outhouse. It's right over here. So he started, I'm, by the way, I'm just watching all of this from, you know, from this, this secret spot, you know, in just uh, divided by the cabin wall. From um, from them, and he took her. He took Aiden over to the side lot, and he said, "The outhouse is right over there." And Aiden, I saw Aiden look and look and look, and Aiden said, "Aiden said, Haimo." Very tentatively, she said, "Haimo, I, I don't see it." And Haimo, of course, had given her a hard time. He said. Well, it's out there, but there ain't no house. So when you feel the call of nature at 45 below, make it fast. <laughs> and the last thing he did is he was walked into the cabin, and the door is about that low, so you got to duck way in, of course, to conserve heat. And um, he said he ducked in, and then he came back out, and he said, by the way, I saw the tracks of a winter bear over there, so beware. And I thought, oh man, that is the that is the straw that broke the camel's back. And I knew Aiden was going to be really upset by that because a winter bear, I don't know if you know what a winter bear is, but a winter bear is a bear that goes into hibernation and hasn't taken enough cal- in enough calories to stay hibernated. And Aiden knew the story about Edna three years before had been attacked by a winter bear. Um, and their dog, their, their husky, interrupted the bear's path, and Edna ran to the cabin and got a rifle. In, in the meantime, the dog, the bear, not to be graphic, but killed and ate their husky, and Edna came running out with a rifle and killed the bear. So Aiden knew that winter bears were something to be fearful of. So when Haimo said that, I thought, oh, my God. We're going to start this trip out just like we did the summer cabin building trip. And it ain't going to be good. Well, the trip turned out to be beautiful, wonderful. Um, Aiden, Haimo's wife, her name is Miti Dow, and her anglicized name is Edna. She's from an island called St. Lawrence Island, which I said is stuck out in the middle of the Bering Sea. And there are two villages on St. Lawrence Island, one called Gamble and one called Savunga. And Savunga is a village of 200 people. And at that time, the Savunga was, Savunga was still in many ways an ancient whaling village, an ancient Yupik Eskimo whaling village. It's changed dramatically since then. But that's what it was then. And Haimo, while he was living alone in the bush, would come out every spring and he would tend to a little dry goods store in Savunga. And he would, he would hunt and whale with the Yupik Eskimos. He's one of the only non-natives to ever, to ever have the opportunity to go whaling, which by the way, he still says is the most exhilarating and terrifying of exper- experience of his entire life. So, um, while Haimo was there, he also fell in love 
He fell in love with Edna or Miti Dawin, and she agreed after they got married to join him in the interior of Alaska, which I always say was an act of courage equal to, to Hymo's when he left Appleton, Wisconsin to go, um, to go into the Arctic on, on his own. It took an enormous, enormous amount of courage and bravery and I guess uh, vision for Edna to leave her village in Savunga and join Haimo in the interior of Alaska. She'd never even seen a tree before. There are no trees on St. Lawrence Island. So when she got to the interior, she couldn't believe it. Anyway, Edna took Aiden under her wing. She taught her how to hunt. She taught her how to shoot. We did some rifle shooting at the range before we went up, but she taught her essentially how to shoot a 30-30, a 30 out 6 how to trap, how to um, cook how to cook snowshoe hair in a Dutch oven, how to cook beaver tail, how to cook seal, all, everything, everything you might imagine. And she also taught her how to butcher a caribou at 38 degrees below zero. And it was a remarkable experience for Aiden to... Edna happened to be one of three girls in her family. And um, so her father taught her, which was kind of unusual in a traditional um, Yupik Eskimo community, for a girl to be taught all those wilderness skills, um, though they were taught some, but for a girl to be taught all those wilderness skills instead of a boy. But Edna's father had had three girls. So she taught Aiden, and Aiden loved her. So... Um, I'll keep this short. Um, there was one last trip, and the last trip was, was the culmination of all our trips. It was what Aiden originally, what Aiden and I originally were dreaming of. It was a backpacking and canoe trip. We backpacked over the Brooks Range with two buddies from, two friends of ours from Alaska, and we canoed out to the Arctic Ocean. And it was the most magnificent um, of all our trips in terms of landscape and wildlife, and probably the most challenging, difficult, and maybe perilous of all our trips. And I say magnificent because the the Chandelar River Valley, which we were hiking up, and the Hula Hula River Valley that we were canoeing down are two of the most scenic places in all of Alaska. We saw moose, we saw well, the caribou weren't quite mo moving and migrating yet, but we saw hundreds of caribou. We saw muskox. We saw golden eagles. When we got to the headwaters of the Hula Hula River, there were, there were two dozen doll sheep just across from where we put our campsite uh, grazing in the mountains. And the next morning, there were wolves probably 70 yards behind our tent howling and singing to each other. Um, we saw lots of grizzly bears on that trip, and we had one kind of special encounter with grizzly bears about five days down the river. Um, we were exhausted. We were, we were canoeing into this wind right off the Arctic Ocean. But, oh, by the way, for we, our first trip when we were building the cabin was the buggiest summer in uh, Alaska in the past three or four decades. The the summer we picked for our big trek was the coldest summer in Alaska they'd had in three days. So in the Arctic, it can be 80 degrees. You can be hiking in T-shirts. We were hiking in all our gear. It was, it was 20 degrees, 25 degrees, 30 degrees, and there were some mornings we woke up to three, four inches of snow. So it definitely wasn't summer. But we, had, we were coming down the river, and we finally pulled over, and we were exhausted. And we set up, set up our sleeping tents and set up our cook, our cook tent, uh, obviously quite far away from each other. And we'd eaten and we were going to go back and sleep. And, uh, our friend stepped out of the, stepped out of the cook tent and said, Oh, oh, here comes Mama Grizz. So we all stepped out and we saw this grizzly coming right at us. So we got out and we locked arms and, we started talking in slow, deep, you know, non-threatening tones and said, hey, Mama Grizz, we're just passing through. Hope you are too. We don't mean no harm. Hope you don't mean any harm, all that kind of stuff. And um, then I looked and I said, not only Mama Grizz, she's followed by two cubs. 
So the two cubs were running alongside her, and all of a sudden, the two cubs stopped. And they'd either scented us or heard us or saw us. And then they stood up and were looking. And then all of a sudden, they broke into a sprint. And they were sprinting right at us. And then, and then we thought, oh, my gosh. And all of a sudden, they put on the brakes. And they stood up. And they started to wander off a little bit to the west. And then their curiosity got the best of them. And they started tearing for us again. They wanted to see what it, who we were. And that's when the, the, the sow got really agitated. So she was running. The cubs were running at us. She was behind. And she was chasing the cubs and trying to herd them off to the side. And we were talking, thinking, oh, my gosh, how is this going to How's this going to play out? Oops, sorry. How is this going to play out? And eventually, the the sow herded him off to this little ledge. And um, she pushed him up this hill. And the the two cubs sat right on the edge and watched us for maybe 10 or 15 seconds. And then they followed the sow off into the tundra. So we started cleaning up. And then Aiden and I walked off to our tent about five minutes later. And then she poked. And those two little cubs had come back to the edge of the ridge and they just sat there and they watched us for about five minutes. And it was really a a real case of serendipity. It was a really, really special experience. Um, The reason I say it was our most challenging trip is because we were hiking for and canoeing for most of the month in snow and ice and rain. So when we were backpacking up, the Hula Hula River is usually a class two to class three river, which Aiden and I had spent a lot of time uh, uh, practicing our canoeing skills before that. Um, You know, anybody who's anybody who's ever been in a canoe knows that canoeing with another person is can be you know, they call them divorce boats for a reason. It can be a very difficult experience. Um, but Aiden and I had spent a lot of time, and I thought we were ready. Well, when we got to the Hula Hula River, the Hula Hula River was high, and we were looking at a river that was not class one, two, and three, but was class two, three, and four. And I thought, oh, my God, this is going to challenge every single skill we have. So for the first first three days, I was yelling at Aiden and I was barking out commands. You know, I was playing the dad and um, and I, I didn't do it especially well. And then after the third day, Aiden finally pulled me aside and she said, Dad, this isn't working. She said, you're going to have to learn how to relinquish some control. You're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to let me read the river and pick our line down the river instead of screaming at me from from the, from the back of the boat and i thought you know that, i mean that you know it's a, it's a, it's a tough thing obviously for any i think parent it's a tough pill to swallow but i realized she was right and um, i could see and i eventually did relinquish control and i could see her as i relinquished control i could see her blossom I could see all that, all that confidence, and I could see not only confidence, but this kind of unmitigated joy, this, this, this kind of reveling in the experience of going down the river because the old man had finally shut up. And, um, I could, and, and, and I thought, you know, this, this is it. This is what I had dreamed of. This is what we had dreamed of. And, and by the end of the trip, all those life skills that I had hoped so dearly that she would discover along the way, you know, adaptability, self-sufficiency, um, um, confidence and perseverance. I could see all of that, all of that really, really shine through. Um, so we eventually ended up um, out on this barrier island where we, we were exhausted, we were tired, we were cold, we thought, and I had... I called and contracted with an Inuit captain, boat captain, to come and get us. Um, and I thought, oh, he'll be here. He'll be here today or tomorrow. Well, I called him on. I called him on the satellite phone. I said, Robert, 
I said, when are we going to see you? He said, five days. And I said, what? And he said, he said, the winds are high. He said, there's no way in the world I'm going to, I'm going to be able to get you for five more days. So we thought, oh man, that is going to be tough. This is a barren wind whipped island. And it was cold, and we were going to be stuck on that island for five days. And Aiden, Aiden well, we were both feeling pretty depressed about it, but we were trapped on that island with a polar bear. Mm-hmm. And with not only a polar bear, but a very, very curious polar bear. And this polar bear would kind of amble or saunter over to our campsite just about every day, And by that time, this other group, um, which was really unusual because you don't see anybody in Alaska, particularly in the refuge, had come down behind us. So we had three or four more people. So when the bear would come around, we'd all join arms and we'd, and we'd, we'd, yeah, we'd yell at the bear. We'd say, get. And sometimes we'd, you know, throw little sticks at him. And eventually he would, you know, very nonchalantly kind of wander off. Until one day, Aiden was Aiden and I were down. It was the fourth day. Aiden and I were down by the by the beach, and Aiden was collecting shells, seashells for her sister. And um, and all of a sudden, I looked up, and there that polar bear was walking toward us. And I said, Aiden, I said, I want you to get up very, very slowly. And she said, Why, Dad? And I said, Just get up very slowly and calmly, and don't talk too loud. And she got up and I said, turn around. And that polar bear kept walking toward us and walking toward us. And we were talking to it and finally it stopped. And the story that Aiden tells, um, when she used to, when she was in high school, she used to do this with me. Um, The story that Aiden tells is if that polar bear had taken one more step toward us, she would have taken off running in the opposite direction, and the polar bear would have caught the slower man, which, <laughs> which, is, which is me. So she was going to sacrifice her dad to the polar bear quite willingly. Anyway, on the fifth day, um, our, our, our boat captain was not able to get us, so he called a bush pilot that was in the area, and the bush pilot put down on this little sand spit and got us out of there and he had to get us, um, he could only take two at a time. And he flew us to this little little Inuit Eskimo village just to the east called Kaktovik. And um, Aiden was sitting behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and she said, look, Dad. And I looked down and there that polar bear was coming down the beach in the direction of our campsite and sniffing all around. So we waved at the polar bear and we said, so long. So, all right, everybody. I've been a long, little long-winded. Forgive me. But thanks for hanging in there. I appreciate it. So if anybody has any questions, I can try to answer them. About Alaska, the TV show, no questions is fine, too. Yeah. now. She's in college. Um, she... She was a river guide for two summers, one summer on the American River, one summer on the Yellowstone River, American River in California, one summer on the Yellowstone River in um, in Montana. And then last summer she went urban. She worked in San Francisco. So, so she still got wilderness roots. And I'm, I'm encouraging. Well, you know, fathers have little say at this point, <laughs> as you may know. So I don't know what she wants to do. She wants to, um, I think she, she's, she's always got a little bit of wandering in her system, which I'm very happy about. Because when I'm 80 years old, I hope she takes me down the river. <laughs> Go ahead. Is there somewhere that um, you haven't visited that you would really like to check out? Oh, God. Everywhere in the world. <laughs> so many places. Um I like, I like taking long, long bike trips, you know, bike packing. Um, they, one of the, both friends that were on us, were with us on this trip, just biked the Continental Divide Trail from, um, Southern Canada, all the, Canada, all the way down to Arizona. Uh, two months. They said it is hard and spectacular. So I'd like to do that, you know, maybe with my wife and third daughter. Um, 
next summer. Um, yeah, they're, God, they're so, I, I, I want to go to Africa with you. <laughs> yeah, I want to go to Central to Botswana and Zimbabwe. Yeah, there are a lot of places. But Alaska is magnificent. But the one thing I always tell people, it's so, and you hear this more and more now, thank heavens, it's so important to get our kids, you know, outdoors, outside, and you don't have to go to Alaska. We grew up a half an hour north of Madison. We spent, the girls grew up on the Ice Age Trail. They grew up canoeing the Wisconsin River. They could go, you know, all that kind of stuff. You don't need to go to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to, to understand, you know, what, what, what nature is all about and the benefits of nature. You can go to the local woods or the local field, and it's really important. <laughs> go ahead. Um, do you kind of want Edna's daughters plan on taking over his campsite at some point? Well, the, the youngest daughter um, has been living out in the bush um, for about three or four months at a time, and then going back into Fairbanks. So they'll spend... They'll spend November through February in the bush. And um, I think that they'd like to spend more time out there. But the only way you can live out there, a lot of people, uh, understandably, are opposed. Some people are opposed to trapping. But the only way you can live out there is to trap, unless you're a trust funder or a Fairbanks lawyer or a Fairbanks doctor. Because you, Haimo, you have to sell, you have to trap and you have to sell your furs. It's the only way to make income out there. So they usually are there during the trapping, trapping season. But I should say that they are the last people. They, so in 1979, um, there was, a, there was an act called the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, which gave the people who were already living in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge the permit to live there because it was federal land. And um, they allowed the, 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 the bush people, the homesteaders who were out there to be there, but the permit to be there ends with the death of their children. So when Haimo's daughters, Rhonda and Crin die, um, their experience in the Arctic will, will be over, and including all the other families too. Go ahead. I'm just curious, like, from, like, medical reasons and that for and the time, well, like, how far away are they in, in the event that they would have, like, a medical emergency or something? Far. <laughs> yeah. So, by bush plane, it's a, it's a three-hour flight. Um, they would, they would have to um, radio Fairbanks, which in turn would radio, in turn would radio Anchorage or the U.S. Army. Edna had a gallbladder attack. Um, out there about a decade ago and was incredibly sick. And someone finally, three days later, after HIMO sent out an SOS, um, and this was via sat phone, prior to sat, the sat phone, then it was really complicated. Um, but it took, took, it took the, um, the army three days to get out there and bring her into Fairbanks. So fortunately, they, they are healthy, but, um, you know, who knows how long that can last. But Haimo, Haimo wants to die out there. Haimo says, Jimmer, when I die, he said, you come up and you put my body out on the tundra and let the wolves feed on me. So he said, I took enough wolves during my time here. They can take me when I die. <laughs> so, and he's dead serious about it too. So, and Haimo's in his mid sixties now and Edna is 67. So, you know, it, it's a tough life. It's a really hard life. Go ahead. All right. Work the last Alaskans. Oh, so it's a TV series, but you can find it on Discovery Channel. You can look on the Discovery Channel website, or you can go to Amazon and I think and you can buy it. But I'm not sure sure how much it, it costs. Or you can go to, you know what Hulu is? You probably know better than I. <laughs> you can get it on Hulu, too. But right now, on Discovery Channel is airing episodes from the first four seasons. And they will be doing that until December. Thank you. Any questions? Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm 
you said when the bears were coming towards you, could have just locked arms? Yeah, like this, to look big and imposing. Okay, because I thought. <laughs> yeah, well, we had we had the shotgun, but the last thing in the world, I guess we we would have resorted to a shotgun if they had kept coming. And I hunt, but the last thing I in the world I'd want to do is shoot a grizzly, particularly a sow with cubs. Yeah, yeah. but we did. Yeah, we did have that as a backup. Uh, go ahead. Is an eyeball of Edna make enough money trapping to stay alive, or they live? They live on. They live on five thousand dollars a year, plus the permanent dividend fund check they got. You know that all Alaskans got from um, oil investments. Um, yeah, it's tough, and the price the price of fur is way way down. So. They, they were paid to be on the show and they were paid decently. And people say, oh, the show you know, might have corrupted them. Uh, it, it's just, it's the exact opposite. The show will, if the, sh if the show continues, we haven't heard if we're going to have a fifth season. If the show continues, they'll make enough money where they won't have to trap incredibly hard to stay out there. Yet they will be, they will be able to stay out there. So, um, Though I get obviously money from the show too, I hope that you know for their sake that the show the show continues. Is there anywhere else in Alaska where you can live on the land besides those places? It's really hard. Once upon a time you could, but that era is over. The every square foot of land in Alaska is spoken for now. Um, they are the state. The state through the Department of Natural Resources does a home site auction. Every so, every so often, you could buy home site plots, which are um, an acre to 10 acres. Um, and they also do it in the Yukon Territory of Canada. Um, but it isn't, it isn't particularly good land. If you just want to go up there and live um, and you, say, have a job in Fairbanks or one of the other smaller communities, it, it's doable. But if you want to go, go up there and plant a garden or you know, raise your own produce, or hunt or trap. It's usually not the best land. So yeah, so that year that era is it is over, and that's in part why uh, the book is called The Final Frontiers. Did you have a question? I was wondering if you had any contact with the other uh, the other <coughs> folks that are while you were up there. Yeah, yeah, a lot. I know I know them all, and they're all wonderful, wonderful people. Um, and they all you know, went up there for relatively the same reason that they, you know, they had big dreams and they wanted, you know, the, in many, but the really interesting thing is there are countless people in Arctic Alaska who are from Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, it's just full. Any, you go into any little village anywhere and it's, you find, you find Wisconsinites and Minnesotans. And I guess, it's, you know, it didn't quite get cold enough here and the woods wasn't quite big enough to hold them. So they went, they went to to Alaska, but the other families are, you know, fascinating too. But a lot of them moved out. The people who used to live around, along the Yukon River left for a variety of different reasons. A lot of them, when their kids got kind of junior high school age and they couldn't homeschool homeschool them anymore, they came into usually Fairbanks. Anything else? Oh, all right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I took my, I wrote a book about anybody, about the Red Arrow Division, the 32nd Division, in which is largely from Wisconsin, and they fought in a place called Papua New Guinea, and I took my middle daughter on a trek across Papua New Guinea. We retraced the route that the men from Wisconsin and Michigan did when they walked across New Guinea, so we spent a month trekking across the jungles in mountains of New Guinea last summer. Um, and my daughter, my daughter would be at the top of the mountain, just wait for her old man, you know, to trudge up the mountain. She was quicker than I. But and my third daughter, I have absolutely no idea. Right now, she wants to go on a food tour of Europe. <laughs> I, said, I said, we don't do food tours. <laughs> okay, and, and I thought I saw one other hand, but if not, uh, thank you all very much. I really appreciate. It.